Welcome, Eagles, to another episode of Trad Cat Night Radio. I am Eric Ajewski, founder and owner of Trad Cat Night, the most viewed and followed traditional Catholic website worldwide. Uh, recently ranked by Alexa in the top 25,000, number one in the world, as I mentioned, according to traditional Catholicism. And today we have a wonderful special guest, first time guest for that matter. We've had other guests talking about Islam and jihad in general. But I think today uh, we, we have the premier guest, the, the cream of the crop, so to speak, with uh, Robert Spencer. And he, of course, runs the website Jihad Watch. We'll get into that in a little bit. So much to talk about with the recent events uh, going on in Ohio State. A couple other things on the horizon here that we'll pay attention to. Erdogan down there in uh, Syria, stirring the, the, the hornet's nest, if you will. Hopefully we can get into that. But let me give you a little bit of a background here on Robert Spencer. He's the director of Jihad Watch, a program of the David Horowitz Freedom Center, author of 16 books, including New York Times bestseller, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam and the Crusades, and The Truth About Muhammad. His latest book is The Complete Infidel's Guide to Iran. Coming in 2017 is The Complete Infidel Guide uh, to Free Speech. Now listen, we could go on for about 10 minutes with <laughs> Robert's background. He, you all have seen him. He's been on you know, Fox. Uh, he's recently been on The Remnant. Uh, I'll allow him to cover any media appearances uh, later on. But, you know, BBC, ABC, CNN, uh, even Megyn Kelly, Kelly's uh, The Kelly File, Sean Hannity, to name a few. And we're glad to get him on today. Robert, appreciate you, you taking time out here. I'd like to get us... Uh, started laying a foundation if you will why don't you tell us a little bit more uh, about your website Jihad Watch uh, tell us you know what you're trying to accomplish it and maybe how you even got involved in studying Islam and exposing some more of its nefarious elements sure Eric uh, and thanks for having me on the website I started in October 2003 because it didn't exist and I was looking for a single site where I could find all the jihad news, everything that was happening in that world, all in one place with commentary that would help to situate it. And so I didn't find such a thing, and so I started it myself. As far as the work in general goes, I uh, came into that as a matter of personal interest. My family is from the Islamic uh, world. My grandparents were exiled from the Ottoman Empire. Okay. 2018 for uh, declining to convert to Islam, and I was very interested in all that, very interested in their life, life there, and uh, one thing led to another, led me into studying this. Uh, since we're such a wide audience, obviously as a basis we're traditional Catholics, but I mean we have a wide, wide audience tuning in. Why don't you give us, uh, lay down a foundation here in regards to Islam 101, Maybe just give us some foundational elements of what they think, how they believe, um, and then maybe what is jihad? Sure. Well, Eric, you know, the main thing, the reason why we're having this discussion right now, the reason why we're talking about this at all, and not talking about Hinduism or Buddhism or uh, any other religion in the world, is because Islam is unique among the religions of the world and having a developed doctrine and theology and legal system that mandates warfare against unbelievers. And that is jihad. Jihad is a fundamental element of Islam. There are all sorts of meanings to the word jihad and there is a distinction within Islamic theology between a jihad that is a matter of a spiritual struggle, an ascetic struggle to improve oneself, and jihad that involves warfare against unbelievers. But there is no doubt from the Quran the Holy Book of Islam, and from the, uh, the example of Muhammad, who is considered normative for the behavior for Muslims, that uh, the primary understanding of jihad, the principal understanding of jihad, is warfare against unbelievers for the purpose of subjugating them under the rule of Islamic law. And that is what the wars are fought for. So, for example, when we see 9-11, uh, that wasn't done just to terrorize or to... Uh, destroy things, but it was done in order to uh, weaken the American economy and the American political system so that ultimately it would collapse altogether and uh, would be replaced by a Sharia state. Install installing Islamic law or Sharia is the ultimate goal of all jihad attacks. 
Yeah, I was just gonna about to, uh, to mention that we've had some other guests on, such as F. William Engdahl, and they kind of talked about this matrimony between the Muslim Brotherhood and the United States. Uh, I don't know what the statistics are in terms of who is, you know, actually in the White House, who is, who isn't. There's even some suggestion of Obama is. Um, you know, how did this all come about? I mean, is, is there a, a certain history behind this? Is this, you know, only a couple decades old? Is it 50 years old? I mean, how did this kind of matrimony begin? You're talking about the infiltration? Yeah. Uh, that started in earnest really uh, after 9-11, but it's been going on before that. The groundwork has been laid for several decades. But uh, after 9-11, there was a concerted effort to play upon American officials' sensibilities, sensitivities rather, to being portrayed as being anti-Muslim and their anxiety about not having the war on terror be a war on Islam. And this was used to manipulate it to get Muslims into positions of power and influence from which they could then steer American policy toward being in line with the Muslim Brotherhood. And so in December 2012, for example, when the Muslim Brotherhood was still in power in Egypt, there was a newspaper there, uh, Rose Al Youssef, that actually ran a story boasting about how Muslim Brotherhood operatives within the United States government had turned the United States around during the Obama administration from being a uh, enemy of Islam, the foremost enemy of Islam worldwide, to being the foremost exponent of the Islamic agenda. This was in an Egyptian newspaper. This was not some creation of so-called right-wing Islamophobes in the United States. Now, what do you make of this whole quote-unquote refugee crisis? There's so many out there with, with different opinions, whether they're traditionalists or not. I think many are fearing the whole kind of new world order multiculturalism, you know, breaking down of borders, patriotism, kind of making this hodgepodge, if you will, that one world socialist republic that the pre-Vatican II popes uh, talked about. You know, how concerned should Americans be? I think it's something like at least 110K uh, new refugees are, are slated for the United States. That may just be one area if, if I read the article uh, correctly. But it seems to me that there are many more people waking up to the reality that there's probably some nefarious ends to this. It's not as, uh, how should I put this? It's not what it appears to be as the mainstream is presenting. I'm it's not a humanitarian crisis, pure and simple. It's much worse than that. And the concerns that you've outlined are entirely justified. In fact, the Islamic State or ISIS had promised, warned in February 2015, a few months before the migrant influx started, that they were soon going to flood Europe with 500,000 refugees. And they weren't meaning just to send refugees to Europe. They were talking about sending jihad terrorists among the refugees into Europe. And so this is exactly what we've seen happening. Every last one of the attackers in Paris who killed 130 people there in jihad attacks last November they uh, were all refugees who had just come into Europe. And uh, Tashfin Malik, one of the San Bernardino killers, uh, I believe it was a year ago today that the attack took, or a year ago tomorrow that the attack took place. In any case, uh, they killed 15, she and her husband killed 15 people at a Christmas party in San Bernardino, California. And she was a refugee. She had actually passed five separate background checks from five different U.S. agencies. And so... The idea that these, this is a pure and simple humanitarian crisis is belied by the fact that there's obvious evidence of refugees, of, of jihadis rather, exploiting the refugee crisis to get into Europe and North America. There's also the fact that half of the refugees are not Syrians, whereas the war zone is in Syria. But the vast majority of the refugees are actually coming from other places in order to uh, gain economic benefit from going on welfare. Now, going on welfare in the United States or in Europe is actually the goal, not not aiding, not to working here to get a better living, but to just take uh, advantage of the welfare apparatus because it is part of Islamic theology also that it is the responsibility of non-Muslims to pay for the upkeep of Muslims. And so uh, Muslims in Africa and Asia have discovered that the Western states have these generous welfare programs for people who don't work, and they consider that their due because the Quran specifies that Muslims should wage war against Jews and Christians until they submit to Muslim hegemony and pay a tax. And that tax is something that the Muslims are exempt from. 
So this is also a very important aspect of the refugee problem. And yet all of this is being ignored. And Catholic Charities is getting almost $100 million a year from the U.S. government to aid in the settlement of Muslim migrants. And so they've been pressing for the uh, Obama administration over the last few years to increase the number of migrants that it's accepting with no regard whatsoever for the fact that there are jihad terrorists among them or the fact that they come with a ready-made model of society and governance that they consider superior to that of the governments to which they're coming, the societies to which they're coming. None of that is being considered at all. So they're just paving the way for a future in the West for us of civil war, upheaval, violence and strife, fighting in the streets and so on. They are opening the door to that and shaming the people who oppose them uh, and saying that they are sinful and ungenerous for not welcoming these refugees. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think many of us kind of see that on the horizon, not only an economic collapse, but these false flags uh, that will, as far as I'm concerned, we've had some, some government insiders come on and suggest that there'll be multiple 9-11 type of attacks which will be pinned on ISIS or some uh, you know radical Islamic group and it will make 9-11 just seem like it didn't even exist. And, and I believe it because I think ultimately they got to try to drag us into war with Islam. But you bring up an ex interesting point, kind of the Catholic charity uh, connection in all this and maybe some Soros money, uh, you know, filtering in through the Vatican. We kind of see that liberal left wing con connection, Soros, Clinton, Francis, maybe get a little bit more into that later. But give us the latest on the OSU attack. It seems uh, ISIS is claiming responsibility for that. What can you give us in terms of an update on that? Is there any latest developments? Well, ISIS certainly did claim responsibility. And there is every reason to think that it's not just empty boasting, not that they necessarily had any contact with Abdul Artan, the shooter. But certainly, the, Abdul Artan was heeding their call. They just recently, just last week, renewed their call for attacks on civilians in America. Yeah. And yeah. they, in attacking, in calling for these attacks on civilians in America, they uh, were harking back to a September 14th, very lengthy fatwa that they issued. And in it, it, it uh, goes on and on at length but it specifies weapons that should be used by the jihadis in attacking Americans. And it explicitly says, uh, if you don't have an IED or a bullet, then stab them with your car, stab them with your, stab them with a knife or run over them with a car, which is exactly what Abdul Artan did. He uh, set off a fire alarm, the students came running out of the building, and he ran them over with his car and then got out of the car and started stabbing them with his knife. With his knife. A butcher knife and so he was following their modus operandi to the letter he was doing exactly what they wanted they called for to be done and so it does seem as if he was heeding their call for lone wolves to attack what they want to do is overwhelm american government and law enforcement with so many plotters so much chatter so many attackers that the system is overwhelmed and collapses of its own weight and then they're able to take advantage of the resulting chaos. And of course, the globalists, they want the same thing because they're trying to pursue a, an agenda that would uh, uh, efface every distinction between people. And so they want, to, they, they want to have jihad attacks here and make essentially the United States as uh, poor, dirty, squalid, and dangerous as every other place on Earth. And then I guess they think in some utopian fantasy that there will be peace because there won't be any point in fighting if every place is just as bad as everywhere else. Yeah, that's a great point. And, uh, yeah, we've covered a lone wolf attack. They also just put out another propaganda video. I think it was from France. You can correct me where they show them, you know, crucifying this guy, slitting his wrist, stabbing his neck, and then, you know, basically uh, gutting him. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, that, I think that's what they're trying to do, though, is, is get us to fear monger. And I think I brought up this point as it relates to kind of this emerging one world religion, that's from my perspective, it seems like they're using the war on terror to kind of normalize the police state. You'll kind of notice after some of these attacks where there, there's more boots on the ground, you know, whether it's the United States or in Europe, uh, for example, after Paris, I think they dropped like something like a thousand uh, new boots on the ground. I think they're using the war on terror in order to basically normalize uh, the police state. I I'll allow you to comment on that, but I wanted to get a specific question in. You know, where in America are the, the areas where are mostly dominated by Muslim or, or that's more drenched uh, with Muslim refugees? 
Well, the main areas, the refugees actually have settled all over the country and mostly in small towns uh, where I think that they, the calculation is that they will, they're trying to overwhelm the voice of rural America, the voice of America outside the big cities and the major metropolitan areas. In other words, trying to overwhelm the areas that elected Donald Trump president of the United States. And so they dropped them in places like uh, uh, Lewiston, Maine, and uh, Twin Falls, Idaho, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, uh, places like that where, you know, they're far more, uh, I, I recently read, there are far more refugees in one small town in Tennessee than there are in New York City and Los Angeles put together. And so this is a calculated effort as well. Um, the major Muslim populations in the United States are, of course, in the Dearborn and Detroit, Michigan area, and in northern New Jersey and in northern Virginia. And those areas are uh, increasingly becoming places where uh, there is very much of a sensibility that if you don't uh, obey Islamic norms, then you're going to suffer for it. Uh, for example, the, uh, the uh, Dearborn area, recent, a couple years ago, there were some Christian preachers, evangelical Christians, who were uh, preaching to Muslims at an Arabic uh, street fair, and not a Muslim street fair, but an Arabic street fair. And of course there are Christian Arabs, but uh, the police actually came, the Dearborn police came and arrested them. Now, of course, it's not illegal to proselytize for any form of Christianity in the United States, but it is illegal under Islamic law. Right. And so that was a very ominous sign that in the Dearborn area, it's getting to be uh, difficult to uh, be a Christian, to be, somebody who is respectful of American law in some areas of Dearborn, it's more as if Islamic law reigns supreme rather than American law. Now you brought up a, a, a name before, and this was one of the questions I wanted to get into today. We have obviously Trump being elected. How does this change the dynamics of American, uh, you know, Muslim relations, both, you know, domestically and overseas? I know Trump's kind of have a, a little bit of a rap, I guess, uh, from some of the, those on the far left. I mean, but, how do you see this this playing out? I mean, do you think it will change at all the relations? Um, I, I guess I'm thinking more terms overseas, but I mean, we could speak to how things will go here domestically. H how do you think the Trump election has changed the game, if any? Well, certainly if he keeps his campaign promises, which is not at all certain, of course, but if he does, then it's going to change everything immensely. Because you mentioned before, and we didn't get a chance to discuss it, so I'll go back to it now, about how globalists are using the war on terror to normalize the police state. Uh, I think that's absolutely true, that uh, there is a real Islamic Jihad threat, but that the response to it from the political elites, both Democrat and Republican, has been completely wrongheaded and has been in the line of, uh, more along the lines of criminalizing and uh, treating as criminals huge classes of Americans rather than dealing with the threat as it is. I mean, even the whole idea of the airport security, you know, I fly all the time, practically every week I'm flying and I get the, 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 you know, you have, you know, what you have to do when you fly, uh, take off your shoes and go through the scanner and uh, put all your metal in a basket and, you know, all the, all this nonsense as if uh, I'm a suspect when actually there's zero chance that I'm going to ca carry out a terror attack on an airplane. And there's zero chance that an 80-year-old grandmother from Iowa is going to carry out a terror attack on an airplane. But because the United States government does not face this problem squarely and does not wish to speak about it honestly and doesn't want to say that it's actually the overwhelming majority of terror attacks are committed by young Muslim men. And so we should work out some sort of way to subject young Muslim men to greater scrutiny. And innocent young Muslim men, if they are patriotic, are just going to have to understand that they're going to have to put up with some inconvenience for the sake of national security because of the nature of the case, the nature of the threat. But because nobody dares to go there, we are all treated as if we are equally suspect. And billions of dollars are wasted on this. And, uh, of course, it's even worse when the revelations came out about the NSA surveillance yeah. and how all our emails are being read and all our phones are being monitored and all this nonsense. And why? Why? What have we done? Well, it's because the United States government does not dare to do that kind of thing to Muslim communities in particular, because that would be to acknowledge that there's a particular threat from Muslim communities in particular, and they don't dare do that. And so in response, instead, rather, they 
do it to all of us and treat us all as if we are criminal suspects. And so the point that I'm coming around to here is this, that a Trump represents the first real challenge to this way of thinking. He's the first candidate since 9-11. Because remember, George W. Bush, right after 9-11, went into the mosque and said Islam was a religion of peace. And that's been the position of the Republican and the Democratic parties ever since. But Donald Trump is the first one to actually suggest that there is a problem within Islam itself and to suggest that he might be willing to deal with this problem more realistically. If he were actually to do that, then he would have to ultimately confront this massive surveillance apparatus that has been built up to monitor all Americans and refocus and repurpose it so that the people who are actually suspects, who are actually more likely to commit terror attacks, are the, are the objects of this surveillance and not completely innocent Americans. I mean, it's not only a violation of our rights, but it is a massive waste of resources. Yeah, I agree with you. I think they're just kind of fine-tuning us for some further New World Order uh, agendas to come. I think it's only going to get worse. Now, I'd imagine you get tons of feedback, Robert. You obviously have a very popular website as well. Uh, what's the climate like in Europe? I mean, we're seeing stories, you know, coming out of Britain, Sweden, Germany, rapes on the rise, women's, you know, women fearing even to go out at night. What, what is the climate truly like over there from the feedback that you're getting outside of obviously covering some of the mainstream news? And then the second question is that, do you see any real possibility of a solid, organized counter-revolution? I dare say another crusade. There's some end-time prophecy as it relates to uh, Catholicism to suggest that there will be a pushback ultimately to Islam's rise, an armed resistance, if you will. I think in Syria and Iraq, there's some smaller groups even developing, kind of doing that uh, line of work. Uh, maybe you can handle those two questions. So the climate in Europe and then possible counter-revolution, organized, structured. Those two questions, I think, are quite related. And it's not up to armed resistance at this point. And I kind of... Course, just for the uh, well-being of the people in Europe. But the fact is that uh, awareness is growing, anger is growing, frustration is growing as a result of these disastrous and civilizationally suicidal immigration policies. And so all over Europe, we're seeing people who are beginning to work against this. And I remember... Poland's I was, one of them, right? I think Poland... I'm sorry. Who? Poland recently came out and was very adamant that they didn't want any immigrants or Muslims coming into the country. I think it was in this past couple yes, of years. Yes, that's right. Yes. And also Hungary and Slovakia and the Czech Republic. Uh, they have been very clear about this. Uh, there are significant groups also in Austria, in the Netherlands, in Sweden, in France that are working against this in Germany as well. In, in the Netherlands, you know, of course, there's uh, Kurt Builders, the politician who has for years been speaking out against the Islamization of Europe. And I remember talking to him a few years ago, and he told me that he didn't think there would be any chance that he was going to become prime minister of the Netherlands because the coalitions against him were so strong. But events have continued to evolve quickly. And so now it looks like he's got a better chance of becoming prime minister of the Netherlands than anybody else does. And so uh, things are changing in Europe rapidly, and they're changing for the better. As I say, I hope that it doesn't come down to armed conflict. Uh, but the uh, certainly the tide is... You there, Robert? You're breaking up on me, Robert. You there? Existing... Back in general, regarding the as in with Francis being Pope, uh, the church is institutionally committed to the idea that Islam is a religion of peace and that it's a Christian responsibility to bring in massive numbers of Muslim migrants, despite the fact that there will be an unknowable number of jihadis among them. Uh, the church in, in institutionally seems bent upon commanding Europe to commit civilizational and cultural suicide. And in the United States, it's not as far advanced, but it's the same thing. Uh, I have uh, been speaking out for years about the Muslim persecution of Christians. I have been banned by four bishops now in various parts of the country from speaking about this. 
uh, in Catholic churches or at Catholic conferences because the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops simply does not want any discussion about uh, the jihad against Christians and the Muslim persecution of Christians worldwide. They're committed indefatigably and unshakably to the idea that dialogue with Muslim leaders, which has never saved a single Christian from being persecuted or a single church from being destroyed, will somehow mitigate jihad activity, and they're bent upon silencing those who dissent. It's interesting that there were people who were dissenting openly for decades from established church teaching that was founded in Revelation, and they didn't care anything about that. But now it, these, uh, these things that are not teachings of the church and cannot possibly be teachings of the church at all, such as that Islam is a religion of peace, they are enforcing more ruthlessly than they ever have enforced uh, actual Christ Catholic dogma. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm, I'm totally there on board. I mean, for, for us, I can only speak for myself. You know, we kind of really follow the mar model of, of Archbishop Lefebvre. And, and he, of course, talked about, uh, the founder of society talked about the Islamic problem right there. And ecumenism to me, yeah, as interpreted by those uh, fo following uh, that aspect of Vatican II is highly Masonic. I mean, it's to me, it's quite obvious that we're in, for, in route, if you will, towards this one world uh, religion in Rome. For my research, they're going to formalize it right around World War Three. So that's why when I go on radio shows, I always talk about, you know, pay attention to the War on Terror, World War Three. Um, it's it, in my opinion, it is nefarious. You know, this whole talk of convergence, coexistence, dialogue. We of course know that it's uh, basically sinful to proselytize, according to certain leaders in the church uh, coming from the top up. We know that to be nonsense. And for me, it's just it's just a holding or a waiting game for the next step of the New World Order plan. As, as sad as that sounds, that's just the reality from my prospect. So let me ask you this. Why do so many people seeing all of this, all of these atrocities worldwide, domestically and abroad, why, why are people still calling Islam the religion of peace? I mean, I mean, there can't well, be no greater propaganda motto, if you will. No, you're quite right. It's a it's a very canny propaganda move. But that's what it is. Uh, the fact is, Eric, that not only is Islam the only religion that has an actual doctrine of warfare against unbelievers, Islam is also the only religion that has an active propaganda arm. Now, of course, let me distinguish right away between that and propaganda fide, which is a little bit different. Uh, propaganda fide in the Vatican, uh, that was about spreading the faith, about proselytizing, evangelization, and so on. But uh, propaganda, when I mean in, in the Islamic sense, I mean propaganda more like Goebbels in Nazi Germany, that uh, there's an active effort by Islamic spokesmen in the West to uh, dissemble and whitewash about the nature of Islamic teaching and to make people think that Islam does not actually teach what it teaches and has no connection with the terrorism done in its name and in accord with its teachings and so on. And that that is the uh, unique propaganda outfit that Islam has that other religions don't. And one of its uh, primary victories, the primary victories of this propaganda operation has been the idea that Islam is a religion of peace and the idea that to criticize, to stand up to oppose jihad terror and the Muslim persecution of Christians and other non-Muslims is somehow an expression of racism, even though Islam is not a race, hatred and bigotry against Muslims, and that therefore it is to be eschewed and rejected by decent people. And uh, the whole uh, invention of the concept of Islamophobia is yeah. one aspect of this. The idea that it really Islamophobia is a term that was coined and taken up in order to intimidate people into thinking that there's something wrong with opposing jihad terrorism. Yeah, I completely agree. Then we have, of course, uh, Obama within his uh, I think it was the last year or so, uh, making a, a direct attack on uh, the Crusades. And I know this is one of the areas that you uh, comment on as well. Maybe you could very briefly talk about some of the myths and misconceptions about the Crusades, obviously with uh, you know Protestantism coming about. It, it, it seems to demonize what the reality of the Crusades actually were. And then maybe you could tie that into the church's teaching on just war and defense because we kind of see this pacifist gospel on the rise. I see it even amongst those uh, in the quote-unquote mainstream church these days. Maybe those two areas, if you can. Sure. Uh, the Crusades in the first place, people uh, have for quite a while now 
it's become the uh, common received wisdom that uh, the Crusades are the cause of the tension between the Islamic world and the West. And the common popular view is that the Crusaders were rapacious colonialist imperialists who swooped down upon the Muslim world when the Muslims were just minding their own business and invaded and colonized. And that this was a precursor to the colonial era and a uh, terrible moral blot upon the West, which is one reason why we see Catholic schools and others now that for years have called their sports teams the Crusaders are changing the name because it's generally been successful in the West, this campaign to make people ashamed yeah. of the Crusades and to think there's something wrong with them. Uh, now, in reality, there were 450 years of jihad attacks mm -hmm. that overwhelmed what had been over half of the Christian world before that. North Africa and the Middle East, people don't know, but the what is considered now the heart of the Islamic world, Egypt, Syria, the North Africa, and so on, that was all Christian. Of course, St. Augustine comes from North Africa, and there were many great Egyptian saints, and uh, people, people have no idea, you know, St. Athanasius. And, and so many others. And the fact is that those areas were conquered and were Islamized. And uh, those things happened in those centuries before any crusade was contemplated. And it was until, it wasn't until uh, pretty much exactly 450 years after those conquests began in the late 11th century that Pope Urban II called the first crusade. And the idea of the First Crusade was not to colonize and uh, terrorize Muslims, but it was to defend Christians in the Holy Land who had been subjected to uh, murders, kidnappings, their churches burned, and so on for quite some time. As a matter of fact, another thing people don't generally know about the Crusades, it's quite remarkable, is that uh, 17 years after the Great Schism and the definitive split between the Western Church and the Eastern, the uh, what's known today, of course, as the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, uh, th that happened in 1054. But 17 years later, 1071, the Byzantine Emperor Alexius Comnenus actually appealed to the Pope for help against the uh, Muslims after the Byzantine Empire had suffered a tr terrible defeat at Manzikert in Asia Minor. And so it was a, a delayed response, but nonetheless still also a response to that call for help that the Crusades began 20-some uh, years later. And it was a uh, recognition of the fact that the Christians were in a very perilous situation in that area, the birthplace of Christianity itself, and they needed to be defended. So it was a late and small scale. There was no effort to win back all the lands that had been lost to the jihadis. So it was a, a tardy, small scale effort to defend Christianity. And uh, certainly the Crusaders did things that uh, we cannot excuse. And I have no interest in excusing. But uh, this does not mean that in the main there was anything wrong with their effort. And it did, indeed, for those 200 years that the Crusaders had a presence in the Holy Land, there were no Islamic incursions into Europe, which is the only time you can say that about since the beginning of Islam. And so uh, it seems likely that the Crusaders actually saved Catholicism in Europe from being conquered and subjugated because if, those, if they had, there had been no Crusades, then we can reasonably assume that the jihadis would have pressed into Europe as they did both before and after the Crusades, and Europe probably would have fallen to Islam. Yeah, and I think we have later in history, too, that the Hussars actually defending uh, Europe. Uh, I think it was in the Austria-Poland area uh, from uh, those Islamic invaders. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I get into debate a lot with Protestants you know, over this issue. We see it more common these days. I have a quote here from St. Thomas Aquinas as it relates to uh, Islam. He says, on the other hand, those who found it sects committed to erroneous doctrines proceeded in a way that is opposite to this. The point is clear in the case of Muhammad. He seduced the people by promises of carnal pleasure to which the concupiscence of the flesh goads us. And I could go on, on, on and on with this quote. The reason why I wanted to bring this up, he later goes on to talk about how he mixed truths 
uh, mingled in with fables and doctrines of greatest falsity. I wanted to get into that a area of Islam and sensu sensuality, if you will, pedophilia, its disposition towards women. We're even seeing now, this is an area that I wasn't really aware of, uh, Robert, the last few years, like serious cruelty to animals i mean i've seen videos of them crucifying cats like upside down just really bizarre demonic behavior and again i don't want to label that across the board for every muslim but i mean where's this to be found in the quran where, where are they getting some of these dispositions from or is it just in general just plain demonic well the crucifying cats there's nothing you can say about uh, that coming from islam those were just cruel and sadistic people uh, doing that, and uh, actually, I'm not even sure. I believe I heard reports that those news stories were a hoax in any case. But even aside from that, there is a great deal in Islam that does allow for cruelty, unfortunately. And uh, you take dogs, for example, and Muhammad ordered all dogs except hunting dogs to be killed. And uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, we see that even to this day, there is a tremendous cruelty to dogs in Muslim countries, notably ones that are very strict about enforcing Islamic law, like Iran and Saudi Arabia. And as far as the pedophilia goes, that also is based on Muhammad's example. Uh, when uh, he was 54 years old, he consummated his marriage with Aisha, who was nine. And because the Quran calls him the supreme example of conduct, uh, the uh, that's considered to be exemplary. And everyone who is a Muslim considers that if Muhammad did that, it must be right. Consequently, child marriage is rampant throughout the Islamic world. There are many states that have very early ages for marrying for girls. The Ayatollah Khomeini, when he became the, when he carried out successfully the Islamic revolution in Iran and became the leader of Iran, uh, he's lowered the, one of the first things he did was lower the marriageable age of girls to nine. And so uh, this was in, in accord with Muhammad's teaching. The fact is also that when the Taliban was toppled in Afghanistan and aid workers went into the refugee camps there and people who had been displaced by the war, by the fighting, they found that half the girls of second grade age were already married and virtually all of the girls older than that were married. And this is pedophilia on a rampant scale that is justified by Muhammad's example. Unbelievable. Another quote we have here from St. John Damascene. There's also superstition among the Ishmaelites, which to this day prevails and keeps people in error, being a forerunner to Antichrist. And we see this from uh, various saints talking about that, being a forerunner to an uh, Antichrist, which is interesting because the Catholic Church in general from uh, the pre-Vatican II popes, at least, always talked about how Protestantism was kind of that middle step before we ultimately would end up into a world run by the Antichrist. Now, I have a figure, uh, you know, sometimes I get attacked, Robert. I got a figure that I've been looking into. His name's Maitreya, who I believe may be this, the one, if you will, the big capital A that so many people are talking about, as crazy as that may sound. And I just recently found out he's got a connection to the Sufis. So I've been trying to do a little bit more research on this and, and the Caliph. There's another group maybe you could shed some light on. I'll, I'll try to pronounce it. It's called Amadia. I think I'm pronouncing A H M A. D. I know them. Uh, the other group, though, Maitreya, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, it's this character. He's he's labeled the Christ. He's labeled Maitreya Buddha. He is uh, who the Buddhists are waiting for. Uh, this particular sect called the Ahmadiyya apparently are preparing the world, the, the, the Muslims for this particular figure to come onto the scene. And apparently, as far as my research can go, uh, and I have a pretty extensive knowledge on what the church father said, uh, on the Antichrist, I mean, he hits the nail on the head. It's really frightening. And well, the Ahmadiyya are only 1.8 percent of Muslims worldwide. They're a very insignificant group, yeah. and they they have a uh, they have a, a a much larger presence in America than they do elsewhere. And there are a lot of Ahmadiyya spokesmen who come out and say after every jihad terror attack that Islam is a religion of peace and has nothing to do with terrorism. And they are, uh, they don't tell people that they are part of a sect that is considered heretical by other Muslims and is persecuted as a result. And uh, the fact is, the Ahmadiyya, it's really, they're not, they're not uh, they, they claim to have a whole lot more power and influence than they actually do. Now, as far as their uh, Messiah figure goes, uh, that's, uh, like I say, it's just, 
I'm not saying that everything you're saying is uh, has no substance to it, but I wouldn't be too concerned about what the Ahmadiyya are doing. They're just not that significant a group. Yeah, it's pretty frightening, though, uh, Robert. When you start really tracing, this guy's got uh, he's got ties to the the rebuild of the Third Temple called the New, New Jerusalem Project, which we know uh, the Antichrist would build rebuild the Third Temple. He's slated to come onto the world scene after the economic collapse. He's connected with the UN. A lot of cardinals have even talked to him. It gets really bizarre and really runs deep. This is an individual you're talking about? I don't know yeah. anything about. Him. Yeah, if you go to his website, I'll let you look at him because, in my opinion, he's going to be arriving on the scene here shortly after the economic collapse. His website is called shareinternational.org. He openly promotes socialism. He's very ecumenical, which we know from the Antichrist will show up first as a man of peace and then basically uh, you know, run rampant. He's even got an image share uh, international s-h-a-r-e international yeah share international.org and it's no, really that's nothing, it's gone it's there's nothing i just went there now there's nothing there yeah cl just click uh click uh oh, but I, related links lord maitreya this is yeah. your guy yeah yeah, yeah so, so anything about this yeah okay we'll just look into him a little bit thing. um it's just it was just kind of interesting because he i didn't realize he had ties to this one sufi uh, Caliphate. He's right now. He's in London. Uh, I'll just tell you this: uh, there's a lot of other traditional Catholic writers who hold him as the would hold him as the Antichrist too, including, in my opinion, Father Malachi Martin. Before his death, came around to the realization that this guy was the one. Kathleen Keating, another radio show host who did who wrote a lot of books. Uh, it's it's very eerie. There's a lot of uh, similarities between what Scripture and tradition say on this character and what ultimately he's doing. The other point I was trying to make is he's got an image that it's called, you know, from Scripture, Abomination of Desolation. The early church fathers talked about how it would be uh, an image of the Antichrist. At least that was a common opinion. He's got an image, and you'll see him making that A-OK -okay sign that we see so many political figures giving, which everyone thinks is not so nefarious, but it is. But it's representative of the cult of man, 666. It's a whole other topic, but just just take a look at him from your side. I'm not asking you to agree with me right now, but it's, it's well, very I don't know anything about it. We're way beyond anything I know anything about. Oh, okay. All right, I never so heard any of this. What I, what I want to get into and give you the opportunity uh, to talk about here, once again, I'm with Robert Spencer. Make sure you get to his website, jihadwatch.org. I want to give him a few minutes here to talk about his new book, The Complete Infidel Guide to Iran. Why don't you break it down, give us a synopsis of this book, tell people where they could buy it. Well, it's at any self-respecting bookstore or at Amazon.com. And it is a guide to what is threatening about the Islamic Republic of Iran, why Americans should be concerned about it, why it may be more of a threat to us than ISIS, and uh, just how bad Obama's nuclear deal with the Iranians is, uh, why the Islamic Republic is uh, so dangerous. People don't realize that they've, been con they've considered themselves to be at war with the United States since 1979. And they are pursuing that war in a lot of ways people don't realize, even uh, working with the drug cartels in northern Mexico. And they're not working with the drug cartels in northern Mexico just to do that for fun. Ultimately, they are hoping to cross over the border into the United States. And uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran is doing that via its uh, proxy, Hezbollah, which of course is also a raid against Israel, but is an international organization that is ultimately designed to undermine non-Muslim governments so that presumably they can be toppled and followed by Muslim governments. The Islamic Republic of Iran has pursued this war footing with the United States for decades. It's still at it. It's, uh, I think most people would be surprised with just how uh, in all, uh, by so many, the many, many ways in which the Iranians are pursuing this war against the United States now that the United States government isn't even acknowledging exists. Why, why is it, Robert, if you could shed some light on this uh, from a historical standpoint, we keep seeing a lot of these top uh, Muslim leaders talking about how they want Rome. We've even seen some dates, you know, by year 2020 or 2025, whatever it is. Uh, you know, why is it so important that that Islam capture Rome? And, it, and is that a true possibility? Oh, it's a very real possibility. I think it's a lot realer than most people realize. Uh, with the massive influx of migrants into Europe, and people don't realize that conquering Rome is something that goes back to the uh, beginning of Islam. Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, he made a very famous prophecy, supposedly, where he said that first the Muslims would conquer the new Rome, that's Constantinople, and of course they did that in 1453, and then the old Rome, 
and uh, there are many, many Muslim preachers, very prominent ones nowadays, who have said that the time for the Muslims to conquer the new Rome, the old Rome, is now, and it's going to happen very soon. Uh, not only did Muhammad prophesy it, which makes it something that is very high on the agenda for Islamic supremacists and jihadis, but it's also, it's just in general, it's considered to be the capital of Christianity. I know that uh, Protestants and Orthodox would disagree, but the as far as the Muslims are concerned, they see that there's this huge Christian world body and it's headed by this one individual. And so that is, as far as they're concerned, the head of Christianity, the capital of Christianity, and they consider that if they were to conquer Rome, that it would be a huge victory over Christianity and a sign that Islam is the one true religion. What are Catholics to make of they, some of these more they, alarming uh, comments coming from Francis these days as it relates to Islam? We even have Islamic leaders kind of patting them on the back, you know, saying you're good, uh, doing good work. Um, I think he's, uh, I have one video out there that, that suggests uh, how Islam is not violent. Maybe you could break that down a little bit uh, in detail from the Quran as it relates to uh, violence specifically, and maybe just reassure Catholics that, you know, we shouldn't fall into Pope worship and, and have this understanding that every time Francis comes out and says something that he's infallible, you know, I always kind of sarcastically joke if he comes out tomorrow and says Cheerios is the best cereal, that the, that's not infallible. Uh, and so there's a lot of confusion these days in the Catholic Church. Maybe you could shed some light on some of the things Francis is saying and, um, you know, just... Absolutely. Go ahead. This is a very important question because uh, it is a big problem. I'd say it's a massive problem and an unexplored, undiscussed problem in the Catholic Church that there is this idolatry of the Pope. Uh, the, the papal authority is very carefully delineated in conciliar documents. And we, uh, we see, on the contrary, that people do treat the Pope as if he were some kind of divine oracle. And every word from his mouth is something that is, is, is tantamount to scripture. This is not only false, but it's damaging and it's wrong. And there's also the concomitant idea that you cannot or must not criticize bishops, much less the Pope. And uh, this is, I think, a very dangerous thing because the bishops certainly are not infallible or impeccable. And the Pope is, uh, according to the Catholic Church documents, infallible in certain very strictly defined circumstances. But if we start to uh, give in to this creeping uh, papal idolatry, then uh, we are going to get ourselves involved in approving of things that are flatly false. And that's what we are nearing now. I was accused recently, I had a debate with uh, Monsignor Stuart Swetland of Donnelly College in Kansas, and we were debating whether Islam is a religion of peace. And I explained to him from the Quran how Islam is not a religion of peace. It tells Muslims, kill them wherever you find them three times. Chapter 2, verse 191, chapter 4, verse 89, chapter 9, verse 5. It says uh, to spite against Jews and Christians until they submit to Islamic rule and pay a special tax. That's chapter 9, verse 29. It says when you meet the unbelievers, strike their necks, that is, behead them. That's chapter 47, verse 4, and on and on and on like this. And he countered by saying that it was magisterial teaching and that I was bound as a Catholic to believe that the church taught that Islam is a religion of peace. Was he citing, he was he citing that. Vatican II? Yes, he was. He okay. well, cited Vatican II saying that uh, even when the Pope is not speaking ex cathedra, you still owe him religious obedience of the mind and will, uh, depending on how often these things are repeated and so on. And he showed how various popes, various re quite recent popes, of course, had all said that something that the things that he understood to be Islam is a religion of peace. I think he was wrong about Pope Benedict XVI in saying that, but he did claim it. And on that basis was saying, see, this is something you have to assent to. Now, I think that that's absurd on its face because uh, the Catholic Church is not Islam and never claimed authority to be able to speak about the teachings of other religions. And uh, the idea that the church can speak authoritatively about what Islam teaches, I think is absurd on its face. And it's damaging because if it, it, is, it is actually and demonstrably false that Islam is a religion of peace, and it is readily, readily demonstrable that Islam has doctrines of violence. And so if the church is magisterially committed to the idea that Islam is a religion of peace, then 
it has contradicted itself and va invalidated all its claims to be able to speak authoritatively about anything. And so this is a very dangerous thing to get into and something that we have to confront. And the idea that uh, the Pope, we have to say the Pope is right or just be careful not to say he's wrong when he says that authentic Islam and the proper understanding of the Quran rejects any form of violence. Well, that's a false statement. I'm sorry it's a false statement. I wish it were true, but it's a demonstrably false statement. It doesn't become true because Francis said it. And it, when Francis says it, we have to respectfully say that is not true. And no Catholic ought to be, or anybody else for that matter, ought to think that they ought to believe it because Francis said it. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, this is an area that I run into uh, problems with priests and bishops, them not understanding that the church didn't start with Vatican II. And as St. John Chrysostom said, you know, is it tradition? Ask no more. There's certain things that we are bound by in the solemn magisterium. When popes, bishops, uh, even a council might be in error, we simply have to, uh, we have to resist it. And we do have to make that public. And some people I just don't think will quite get that concept. Uh, nevertheless, we, we also had, what, the Dean of Rhoda the other day attacking the four cardinals, uh, the conservative cardinals, Burke being one of them, for simply coming out and asking for clarification on the latest uh, apostolic exhortation. And, you know, he was saying that they would decardinalize them. I mean, it's just, it's getting maddening. Well, Incredible. Was, but you see, even that, I mean, it's, it's scandal. They can't even ask questions. They can't ask for a clarification. Is this a totalitarian state? Or is this, are we committed to the truth at all? If, yeah. they are, if they really believe that what they're saying is true, then they ought to be willing to defend and explain it. But yeah. that they won't is very telling. Yeah, that's it, uh, Robert. So we just, we just got to keep resisting and keep praying, really, and, and exposing and, and, and making it public. I forgot to ask this question uh, earlier, Robert, before we get going here. Uh, what, what's your take on the latest going on with Erdogan? Uh, recent comments saying he's going into Syria to basically, you know, a plant, if you will, Assad. How do you think this is going to play out? I mean, is this just all talk? I mean, we kind of see this kind of wars and rumors of war situation going on for a while. With this latest threat, is, I mean, is there any viability to it? You know, how will Putin respond? How is Trump going to respond after? Is, is the United States going to take Turkey's side? The United States ought not to. I mean, if Obama and if Hillary Clinton had been president, then there would be no problem with that uh, statement by Erdogan. And we would go on as before because the uh, Obama administration and Hillary Clinton were both committed to the idea that the, uh, uh, you got to take out Assad and that even to fight the Islamic State, it's imperative to take out Assad. Putin, on the other hand, uh, has said differently, and he, Putin is actually right. Uh, he has said that uh, you, can't, you have to support Assad. Uh, now, he hasn't said that Assad is a scoundrel, but he is. And the fact is that you still have to support Assad because Assad is the only bulwark against ISIS that is of any significance. If Assad is taken out, as uh, Turkey wants to do and as Obama wants to do, then the beneficiary is going to be ISIS. And this is what Erdogan wants to do himself because he himself wants to restore the Ottoman Caliphate. And so he wants to co-opt ISIS and make it part of his larger caliphate. So he doesn't really want to hurt ISIS. He wants to hurt the enemies of ISIS. And that's why he wants to take out Assad. And so, uh, yeah, it's very likely the situation could escalate. But the idea of taking out Assad is only something that would be in aid of the Islamic State or the overall goals of those who want to see a caliphate in that area. Now, is there any cause for concern of a, of a revived Ottoman uh, Empire. I was just on Veterans Today. I mean, I haven't got a chance to look at it, but basically uh, the, the article was trying to make it seem that Turkey is essentially ISIS. Uh, I, I know there's so many opinions out there, but I mean, is there any cause for concern that there could be some sort of revived Ottoman Empire that just kind of sweeps and moves through Europe? Sure, that's what uh, Erdogan wants to do. That's what he wants to restore. And so that would mean, uh, as I said, gaining the territory of ISIS and moving the caliphate over to Ankara or Istanbul with him as the caliph, and then moving into Europe on that basis. Absolutely. This is a very real possibility. 
Absolutely. Great talk today with uh, Robert Spencer. What I like to do for my for my guests, Roberts, is, is give them the last few minutes here to relay any upcoming articles, projects, media appearances, do a little bit of shameless self-promotion. I don't mind it whatsoever, and I'll kind of close this out here. But I appreciate you coming on and getting your insights. And, yeah, this is, uh, this is an area that we all need to keep an eye on. Uh, you could even maybe give your prospects for 2017, if you like, you know, anything on the horizon that maybe – uh, we're not seeing that mainstream media is not taking a look at uh, extensively. Whatever you'd like to get into, but you can close us out. Well, a couple of those things coalesce because uh, one of the thing, one of the biggest uh, challenges, one of the biggest problems that is completely ignored today is the war against the freedom of speech and the attempt to criminalize dissent and institutionalize the uh, the idea that to question the political and media elites is wrong in itself and to be prosecuted. Uh, people have no idea this is going on and it's far more advanced than people know. And uh, I actually have a book coming out. Uh, it's finished now, but they're holding it, unfortunately, and it won't be out until next summer, called The Complete Infidel's Guide to Free Speech and Its Enemies. And it uh, discusses this in, in great detail. Yeah, I agree with you. Mainstream media is attacked. I mean, I, I don't know how often you are censored i can't even post my own articles on twitter anymore i've been banned half a time uh, half a dozen times on facebook twitter i have problems accessing my account uh youtube i've had videos pulled and now mainstream media is trying to label alternative news websites as fake news so i guess apparently what we have to put out there is is not at all reality so yeah we, we can kind of see where this is going robert and uh, you know, again, get to jihadwatch.org. There's actually a link right there on his page where you can order uh, his latest book, The Complete Infidel Guide uh, to Iran. Be sure to pick that up. Be sure to pick up all of his updates. Again, his analysis, his commentary from him uh, and his team as it relates to a lot of these news stories that are not being seen by the public. Uh, I don't think most people are taking this area too seriously here in the West. They kind of look over in Europe and they say, oh, well, that's over there. It's not here yet. Well, I hate to uh, be the bearer of bad news, but that is the new world order plan is to essentially drag it over to us. Uh, so well, I appreciate it, uh, Robert, coming on. Uh, look for this talk on my social media, also on Veterans Today, a monster website, top 20,000 website. So this will be going out and abroad. Uh, please continue to keep me in prayer. Keep Robert in prayer. And until next time, my good friends, stay safe and God bless.